Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 noon. We're going to get started. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I'd like to start with a brief land acknowledgement. McGill University is on land which has long served as a siting of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which we now gather. So I'd like to ask Dr. Alain Bitton, uh, the uh, Director of the Division of Gastroenterology, uh, to introduce our speaker today. Alain, Alain the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nadia. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Oka Safif, who's Associate Professor in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. So uh, Oka has completed an advanced fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and then completed a master's in epidemiology. So currently he is the GI Site Director at the MGH, and he is the IBD Research Director in the MUHC-IBD Center at the MGH. And really, uh, Oka has, over the last few uh, years, has uh, become you know, recognized as a leader in inflammatory bowel disease with particular expertise in clinical trials and therapeutic uh, drug monitoring. So Wakas, uh, welcome, and uh, he'll put us up to date in IBD with his talk on new treatment paradigms in inflammatory uh, bowel disease. Thank you very much, Alain, for the introduction, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to present uh, today. So I'll be talking about uh, new treatment uh, paradigms in inflammatory bowel disease. Here are my uh, conflicts of interest, and here are the learning objectives. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about new treatment paradigms in IBD in 2024 and discuss how these advancements uh, has impacted the care of IBD patients. And also we'll have a brief segue into the utility of fecal top protectin in clinical practice. So just before I get started, I just want to sort of highlight um, some of our clinical activities at the MGH. Um, so as you know, we moved uh, to D7 uh, from D16 in 2021, um, and that's where we have our uh, standalone IBD clinic right across from um, the general GI clinic and endoscopy. We still have a few respiratory patients that still uh, pop by once in a while, but uh, after four years, I think we've sort of secured our, our place um, on D7. Um, we see quite a few patients, about uh, 5,500 patients uh, per year. Uh, and then we also have our, our nursing visits, about 500 nursing visits, um, 4,000 phone calls, and, and a whole lot of emails, um, about 11,000 or so of the last year. Um, and we're staffed by uh, five IBD uh, physicians, uh, two secretaries, four IBD clinical nurses, including a telemedicine nurse, uh, two research nurses, two research admins, half-time psychologists, and a GI IBD nutritionist as well. Um, and just before anyone gets too anxious, most of this is, is coming from uh, research or, or private funding, and only a small minority is actually coming um, from the hospital, but hopefully we can get that to change at some point soon. So I decided to uh, try something a little bit different uh, in terms of rounds, rather than sort of just um, talking about new treatments that are available and naming you know four or five new biologics that we have in IBD. Uh, that you'll probably forget the names of. I want to sort of talk a little bit more about um, treatment paradigms in, in 2024 for um, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and we'll, we'll do that using three recently published articles in 2023 and 2024. Um, so we'll talk about pre-biologic therapy, um, early biologic therapy, and dual biologic therapy. So the first uh, paper was published in Gastroenterology uh, last year. Um, and this paper looks at early ileocecal resection for Crohn's disease, uh, comparing anti-TNF uh, medication versus surgery in a population-based cohort. Um, I'll just maybe just take a few sort of minutes um, of your time. So I'm not sure if any of you there were there in 2015, almost 10 years ago, and, and I sort of gave grand rounds um, at that point, um, and I talked about um, how, how uh, the surgeons were very anxious to, uh, to operate on our patients, and I was a little bit more hesitant. And so I'll just replay the video. It's only two, two minutes or so just to Bear with me, and then it's all in good fun. So I thought we'd have some laughs. I have a few IBD patients. The general surgery is also following. I will page the general surgery service to discuss these patients. General surgery is coming. I am looking forward to talking to them about my patients. Thank you for coming to speak to me about my IBD patients. They are quite complex, and I thought it would be better to speak in person. No problem. Always happy to hear about patients that need surgery. Okay, so I have one patient with a SBO. He has an ileal stricture, and he is not opening up. I agree. I will take him to surgery now. I will take all of your patients to surgery now. Okay, thanks. 
The other patients do not need surgery just yet. One patient has severe colitis and partially responded to the first dose of infliximab. I will give a second dose now. I will take him to surgery now. It will be faster than waiting and then you can discharge him sooner. It is a simple surgery. He will need to have his colon removed eventually. No, I think we should wait. The third patient has an abscess. I will start antibiotics. But if he doesn't respond, he may need surgery. I will take him to surgery right away. I have free time now. I will take out his colon now. It is very straightforward. Thank you for referring him. No, we will wait to see if the antibiotics work. His abscess is near the small bowel. Please do not take out his colon. Why are you telling me these details? I have free OR time for these three patients. I will take them to the OR for surgery. They will be discharged post-surgery. Okay, so I have decided that you only need to keep following the SBO patient. I will take care of the rest. Thank you for your help. Okay, surgery will sign off. We do have free OR time. So let us know if anyone needs their colon removed. It is a simple surgery and the patient could be discharged after. Okay, so I have to go now. This was quite enlightening. Please do not follow me. We have moved the patients and we are not telling you where they are. So uh, it's hard to gauge uh, opinion on that uh, video online, but um, hopefully that added some com comedic relief to the rounds. Um, but just things have changed in the last 10 years or so. And so um, right now it's actually very difficult to get patients to the OR, um, especially our, our IBD patients because of the limited resources we have. And so just going back to our topic in terms of ileocecal resection for Crohn's disease. So early effective therapy is important for improving long-term outcome in Crohn's disease. And generally in the past, this has meant um, early effective therapy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And tr traditionally surgery has been reserved for management of Crohn's disease complications. Um, so in 2017, um, the Lyric Open Label RCT was uh, was published, and this was a RCT comparing ileocecal resection uh, versus infliximab as first line treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. So particularly ileocecal disease, um, and this was limited sort of ileal involvement less than 40 centimeters uh, with no complications uh, in about 150 patients or so. And um, the quality of life um, aspects were comparable at one year. There was lower costs associated with surgery at one year. And then um, in 2020, 2020 uh, they published sort of a long-term follow-up of those patients. And you can see those patients that had ileocecal resection, um, no, none of those patients needed a repeat ileocecal resection, and about 42% of the patients needed uh, no additional therapy. So they did well without any additional therapy, whereas the other um, 50 or 60% required either MTTNF or thyroperians. Um, in the infliximab group, about 50% needed ileocecal resection, and the other half uh, continued on medications or were switched or uh, dose escalated. Um, so this is um, sort of the, the background. And so in this study, uh, they looked at long-term outcomes of uh, patients that underwent ileocecal resection versus anti tnf therapy as a primary treatment for ileal or ileocecal Crohn's disease. Uh, which was initiated within one year of diagnosis. Of, it's a population-based uh, Danish cohort, um, and this was from 2003 to 2018. Um, the primary outcome was a composite outcome of uh, hospitalization, uh, systemic steroid exposure, Crohn's disease-related surgery, and perianal Crohn's disease. And you can see here, uh, they had about 1,300 patients uh, that were relatively equally divided between anti-TNF and ileocecal resection. Um, and those patients that had an ileocecal resection actually had a 33% lower risk of long-term adverse outcomes. Um, and those outcomes or adverse outcomes were Crohn's disease-related hospitalization, use of systemic steroids, uh, surgery, or perianal Crohn's disease. Um, so there was a benefit um, in terms of avoiding these outcomes uh, with ileocecal surgery. And so if you look a little bit more in detail, those patients that had ileocecal resection, um, about... Um, 20% 20, 20 of those actually ended up needing an anti-TNF, uh, and about 30% uh, needed immunomodulators. Uh, but about half the patients actually did not end up needing any treatment, and that extended to at least 10 years or so. Um, so still a fairly good outcome for about half the patients or so. Uh, in the anti-TNF arm, you can see about 50% of the patients um, ended, ended up needing, um, uh, sorry, 
about 30% uh, of the patients or 20% of the patients needed an alveolar sepal resection. Um, and about 25% uh, of the patients ended up continuing on their infliximab, but most patients had to switch to another biologic. So uh, just sort of kind of taking a glance at all of these, um, these studies. So early ileal sequel resection patients um, with Crohn's disease or select patients with Crohn's disease appear safe and associated with long-term, improved long-term outcomes. And again, this is sort of limited ileal disease. Um, the study supports previous data um, and suggests that uh, those patients that have an early ileal sequel resection uh, may actually have a durable remission uh, lasting more than uh, five to 10 years. Um, and something that has changed uh, is that ileal sequel resection does not need to be reserved for patients with complications of Crohn's disease. So these are the studies that have been sort of published on this. We haven't really been proactive in terms of, um, you know, trying this out in patients and those very select group of patients that wanted surgery and didn't want biologic medications. We have done this, uh, but right now, uh, our first sort of go-to is still a, a biologic, but I think that paradigm uh, may switch um, in the coming years or so. Um, in the second study uh, that we'll discuss, um, this was actually a biomarker um, study uh, looking at two treatment um, ways, two treatment strategies for patients with newly diagnosed Crohn's disease. Uh, and this was a multi-center open label RCT. So in the end, the biomarker, I'll, I'll sort of spoil it for you, the biomarkers didn't help, but I just wanted to show you the results uh, because it does actually impact the way that we treat patients. Um, and so the role of biomarkers in the treatment of Crohn's disease is increasing, and they were testing a blood-based CD8 uh, positive T-cell biomarker, which had shown some promise uh, in other cohorts. Um, and they were going to use this biomarker to help sort of uh, profile patients um, and patients were either randomized to a top-down or accelerated step-up treatment, which I'll explain in a second. And so patients uh, with newly diagnosed Crohn's disease, either uh, clinically uh, or biochemically with some endoscopic evidence of active disease, uh, were randomized to either getting sort of this top-down treatment, which was sort of an infliximab and a modulator, um, or an accelerated step-up treatment where they got steroids, uh, followed by thiopurines, followed by an infliximab, and they were stratified according to this biomarker. And the primary endpoint was uh, uh, sustained steroid and steroid free remission at week 48. Um, so these are the two groups. And again, in 2024, where we're not really doing the step up as much anymore, and uh, most patients end up going this top down uh, treatment. Um, and so in this top down treatment, you started on somab and thyropurine. Um, and if you didn't do well, then um, this was dose escalated or your biologic was changed. In the accelerated step up, you started on steroids. If that didn't work, then thyropurines. And if that didn't work, um, then you started on biologic medication. And so this is the, the results for about 385 patients or so. And I think the thing that kind of highlights um, what's different in this group and what, why this is important is that the median time from diagnosis to trial enrollment was less than two weeks. So that means within two weeks of getting your diagnosis, um, you're already randomized to one of these uh, treatment strategies. And that's a little bit shorter than what we can do in clinical practice right now. Uh, but I think it, it's important to sort of highlight because when you look at the rates of remission um, in terms of that top-down group, it was sort of an incredible 80%. And again, this is a very hard endpoint of steroid-free and surgery-free remission at week 48 compared to the 15% in the step-up therapy. Um, so usually our, our rates of remission are about 30 to 40%, and this is almost double that. So there is something to be said about her starting therapy early. Um, in terms of the biomarker effect, there was actually no difference in terms of the two different bio, uh, the, the biomarker that was assessed, whether it was um, that biomarker was positive or negative, there was no difference in terms of the response uh, with either the step up or the top time group. Um, if you look at endoscopic remission, which is a bit harder endpoint, uh, week 48, again, there was about a 20% delta uh, improvement in those patients that had that top-down approach. So again, highlighting that not only the top-down approach is important, but also um, the early treatment um, is important as well. Um, you would think that you're starting all this treatment at the same time, maybe there's a higher risk of side effects. In fact, there is lower adverse events in the top-down group with fewer complications, uh, fewer surgeries, and no increase in infections. And so in this study, um, looking at the top-down treatment with infliximab and immunomodulator, um, it achieved substantially higher steroid and surgery-free remission compared with accelerated step-up treatment in patients with Crohn's disease. It provides further evidence suggesting that early advanced therapy as early as two weeks could lead to higher rates of endoscopic remission. And, and one thing to sort of highlight um, is that in Quebec, um, for Crohn's disease and for ulcerative colitis after you've treated um, after you've tried traditional treatments, so 5-ASA and steroids for ulcerative colitis, 
and steroids for Crohn's disease, uh, you don't need to go to thyroperinus anymore. You can actually get reimbursed directly um, for biologics. So that's going to sort of cause a bit of a, a treatment shift as well, because now we'll be able to sort of use these more effective and safer medications earlier on in the treatment paradigm um, and hopefully improve our rates of remission. Again, this is something that's new within the last uh, one year or so. Um, so you'll probably be seeing a little bit less of biopurine and methotrexate monotherapy. Um, you might see it in sort of combo therapy uh, with a biologic, but monotherapy on its own, you'll probably see a lot less of it uh, with new patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And unfortunately, uh, we still need some predictors to stratify um, which patients would sort of benefit most by this top-down approach. But I think in the meantime, um, it's probably better to treat, over-treat uh, sort of a group of patients uh, rather than under-treat because there's a, a higher risk of complications um, and poor efficacy with our biologic medications in those patients that we wait a little bit longer to treat. So... I'll take a little interlude to talk about biomarkers uh, and specifically fecal calprotectin in clinical practice. Um, and so we've always sort of kind of searched for a non-invasive biomarker to assess intestinal inflammation and guide our treatment decisions. And um, in the past, we used a lot of CRP. Unfortunately, the main problem with CRP is that it's uh, very poorly sensitive, only about 50% or so. And so we can't really use that as a, as a, a good biomarker to detect endoscopic activity. So fecal calprotectin has been around for a while, um, and we use it as a screen for IBD. It's a protein released by neutrophils uh, and indicates inflammation within the bowel and can certainly help distinguish IBD from IBS. Um, and um, in studies, primary care fecal calprotectin testing can avoid unnecessary, unnecessary invasive investigations and reduce the time uh, from diagnosis to treatment, which I just highlighted is very important. Um, and because fecal calprotectin has such a high negative predictive value, it's great um, as a test to sort of uh, differentiate IBS for IBD. So um, you can see here, these are other reasons why fecal calp would be elevated aside from active inflammatory bowel disease. So obviously infectious etiologies. So if you have a viral gastroenteritis, doing it in a fecal calprotectin will be very helpful. Um, and you probably better to wait until the infectious symptoms are improved and use the fecal calprotectin a little bit later. Certain neoplasm can sometimes increase fecal calprotectin. A whole host of different inflammatory conditions can also increase fecal cal. Um, and then uh, in patients with PPIs and NSAIDs, um, that can also increase your fecal calprotectin um, a little bit. But when you start seeing levels that are very high, sort of above 1,000, then it's unlikely to be NSAIDs or PPIs. And so just sort of highlighting why it's uh, so useful in differentiation between IBD and IBS. This is a meta-analysis that was published uh, a while ago by one of our residents. Um, and so if you have that pretest probability, so you see a patient in clinic and they're having some GI symptoms and you're not really sure, you maybe have a 30% probability that there might be some inflammation in the bowel and you do the test and it's less than 50, uh, then the post-test probability is about two or 3%. So you can be fairly confident that um, someone that comes into your, you know, uh, internal medicine clinic um, and has GI symptoms. And again, again uh, IBS is much more common than IBD. And we see IBS in about 30 to 40 percent of the population and, and symptoms sometimes mimic inflammatory bowel disease. And so in that patient that has those GI symptoms and they have a low uh, fecal calprotectin at less than 50, uh, you can be pretty sure that um, there's not going to be any active inflammation. And so that patient probably doesn't need to be need to have a colonoscopy and you can kind of forego that and follow the patient clinically. Whereas if the patient does have a high fecal calprotectin above 200, um, then there probably is some active inflammation that's going on and that patient uh, you know, needs to have a colonoscopy. And so um, filling out the, you know, that AH702 form or the direct colonoscopy form um, you indicate, you know, possible IBD, and that'll be triaged a lot faster uh, and will be done a lot quicker um, than in patients that don't have a fecal calprotectin. So uh, sort of my my sort of word of, of wisdom would be here that in patients that you want to have um, their colonoscopy done quicker because you're worried about active inflammation or inflammatory bowel disease, then doing a fecal calprotectin will be very helpful in, in triaging those patients and having those patients seen uh, a lot quicker. Um, so what about using fecal calprotectin in patients with IBD? And so if you look here, uh, fecal calprotectin has a very good sensitivity, about 90% or so for detecting active inflammation in the bowel. This is using our gold standard, which is colonoscopy, and a sensitivity of about 70% or so. And so in clinical practice, we use this quite frequently. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of, um, you know, endless sort of endoscopy or colonoscopy resources, and we sort of want to reserve 
colonoscopy as much as we can for the, those patients that really need it. And so using a fecal cap protectant um, cut off of about 250 or so where we know that there's active inflammation, those are the patients that will sort of treat a little bit differently or try to optimize their treatment, change their treatment, or uh, end up doing a colonoscopy for those patients. Whereas if their fecal cal is less than 250, we're a little bit more reassured um, with the current treatment and that there, um, there won't be that much inflammation in the bowel. And so what are the results of close monitoring look like? So this was a randomized uh, control study that was published a few years ago called the COM study using adalimumab. And so you can see here, there was uh, two groups of patients. There was a normal just clinical management group and a tight control group. The main difference here being that uh, in the tight control group, if your um, fecal calprotectin was elevated, even if you were in clinical remission and off steroids, um, and you're doing great, but your fecal calprotectin was 252, um, you would actually get dose escalated. And so if you do that, and this, this is during the first year of therapy, um, you can increase endoscopic remission or mucosal healing by about 15%. And just to sort of highlight, our, that's our main goal is to get endoscopic remission and our main sort of target of therapy um, is endoscopic remission or mucosal healing. So having, having a 15% increase in um, mucosal healing and the sort of Quite dramatic, and this is something that we're actually practicing in clinic uh, quite often in that first year of biologic uh, treatment. We're asking for fecal cap protectin protectants quite, uh, quite regularly to uh, make sure that the patients are in remission, and if they're not, uh, we uh, try to escalate or optimize therapy. So, our, so the conclusions for biomarker: so fecal cap protectin helps to differentiate um, between IBS and IBD, and prioritize such patients with likely IBD and hopefully get them to early treatment. Um, we use proactive fecal cap protectin uh, to optimize our, our IBD patients. And um, right now, one of the main issues with fecal cap protectin is that it takes about two weeks to get the results back, or up to, uh, sometimes up to four weeks. It's so not ideal for if you want to try to change therapy. Um, that's changing a little bit more. We have home-based fecal cap protectin, which our patients like, so they can actually do the test at home um, and then sort of scan um, uh, the the image, um, they add sort of a, a solution and that changes color. Um, and they can take a picture of that with their iPhone or their smartphone and it actually gives the fecal cal protectin testing. So a lot of our patients uh, enjoy having that at, at home so they don't have to carry around their stool. Um, and the other um, sort of change uh, that's kind of upcoming is that there's actually a point of care fecal cal protectin. So when patients come in um, for their follow-up visits, we can ask them to bring a sample of stool and you know, have the results within 30 minutes or so. And so we can get a, a quick fecal cal protectin assessment in those patients that have ac having active symptoms. And so a lot of the times those symptoms might be related to active IBD or sometimes that might be related to IBS. And so having an, an objective marker of disease is very important. So hopefully that allows for more timely optimization. Um, what, what's new that's coming up, there's some wearable devices, so sort of smart wearable watches that actually can detect CRP or TNF concentrations um, from sweat-based um, from sweat-based solutions. And that's probably something up and coming and will give us even a more uh, tight control of what's going on um, in terms of active inflammation. And just sort of to finish up in terms of uh, the third study that I wanted to present, um, and this is taking a look at dual therapy or two biologics given at the same time. Uh, and this was published recently as well. Um, in the Lancet, and this is looking at gasalcumab and golimumab combination. So gasalcumab is an IL-23 medication, golimumab is an anti-TNF med medication, um, and this is patients in ulcerative colitis, and sort of a proof of concept um, study. And so sort of just to kind of highlight um, what we have available now for ulcerative colitis. So um, after sort of evaluating the patient, uh, looking at their disease ex extent and severity, and uh, their nutritional status, patient preference, and again, this is patients that have failed 5-ASA therapy uh, or traditional sort of 5 um, and steroid therapy. And now we're thinking about biologic. You can see we have quite a few biologics that are available. Um, and we have anti-TNFs, we have JAK inhibitors, IL-23 or IL-1223s, and S1P inhibitors as well, uh, with the JAK inhibitors and the S1P inhibitors being oral medications. But one of the issues is that we actually don't have any um, very few head-to-head -head trials comparing all of these agents. And so the only head-to-head -head trial we have is vetalizumab versus adalimumab. And uh, vetalizumab did better, and that's why you don't see adalimumab on this on this diagram. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have a ton of head-to-head -head studies 
uh, comparing all of these medications. In Crohn's disease, there's one sort of head-to-head study comparing an IL-23 to an IL-1223, so rizinkizumab versus ustekinumab, and rizinkizumab was better in anti-TNF exposed patients. And so um, the head-to-head trials are coming and will help us kind of figure out which treatments are best uh, for what patients. Uh, but in the meantime, we're sort of kind of a crapshoot in terms of which medication you choose. Um, obviously, there's certain circumstances where you use one or the other. Uh, but in sort of that moderate to severe ulcerative colitis without any extra intestinal manifestations, um, it's sometimes hard to, to decide which medication um, is best for the patient. All that being said, regardless of the number of medications that we have, um, our clinical remission rates and our endoscopic remission rates are quite low, ranging from 30 to 40 percent. Uh, we have used dual biologic therapy, um, not only in patients that have sort of extra intestinal manifestation, and so the rheumatologists are using one biologic and we're using one for um, either their ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So we actually have patients that are quite refractory. They were using two different mechanisms of action, um, specifically for their inflammatory bowel disease, and we have a handful of those, and um, it does seem to work uh, relatively well. Uh, in patients that have very refractory disease. Um, and so in this study, they were looking at the use of dual biologics in naive ulcerative colitis patients, so patients that hadn't been exposed to any biologics, to take a look at their clinical remission rates. Um, in this study, they looked at either an anti-TNF medication as monotherapy during induction for the first 12 weeks in IL-23 medication, and then sort of the combo or the dual biologic of both of them together. At week 12, um, they continued on therapy, but just monotherapy, uh, and that was either the IL-23 or the anti-TNF. And if you look at the baseline characteristics, so these are patients that have had ulcerative colitis for about five years. Again, these are bio-naive patients, but relatively severe patients, about 50% having severe ulcerative colitis on endoscopy, and about a third of the patients have been exposed to immunosuppressives in the past. And so if you look at the clinical remission rates at week 12, and again, week 12 is a fairly quick endpoint, uh, but about uh, 20% difference between those patients that were on monotherapy uh, versus combination therapy. And so it's a significant advantage of giving uh, the dual biologic therapy uh, as of week 12. And then as you look at week 38, um, you can see again uh, about um, 10 or 15% improvement in endoscop uh, endoscopic improvement. Uh, and about a 10% uh, improvement in terms of endoscopic normalization. And then if you take a look at histology and um, uh, endoscopic improvement, you can see it again about a 20% uh, delta with the patients that had combination therapy at the outset and then continued on uh, monotherapy IL-23 compared to just getting IL-23 all the way through or anti tnf all the way through. So again, something that kind of shows that maybe um, giving dual biologics might actually increase our uh, rate of clinical and endoscopic remission. This was shown in Crohn's disease as well. This was the Explorer study that would combine uh, vetalizumab, uh, which is an alpha-4 beta-7 molecule, adalimumab and anti-TNF and methotrexate. And sort of just taking a look at the uh, slides, um, the two graphs on, on the right, uh, looking at endoscopic outcomes uh, in the Explorer study. Um, so the endoscopic remission rate in observed cases was about 42%. If you sort of compare that to patients that only had gotten vetalizumab, this was another study, uh, it was about 20%, so almost uh, twice the number of patients were in endoscopic remission uh, at the end of week 26. Um, so again, another study that kind of highlights uh, the role of dual biologic therapy. And so in this study, uh, the combination of both drugs uh, achieved higher rates of clinical and endoscopic remission. This is a very important landmark RCT uh, that demonstrates that dual biologic therapy during induction in bio-naive patients uh, may help to break the current therapeutic ceiling. In fact, we have two ongoing studies that we're participating here at the MUHC, combining uh, an anti-TNF and IL-23 in a single injection. Um, and this is uh, being done in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So hopefully in the next one to two years, we'll have a little bit more data in terms of trying this in clinical practice or sort of combining two different biologics. Um, this has been done, you know, in other sort of disease processes. I think uh, rheumatology has a couple of studies which showed increased uh, morbidity or mortality when you're combining two different agents together. I think what's different a little bit in, uh, in IBD is that we're using medications that have a very sort of low risk of complications. So particularly the IL-23s um, and metalizumab um, a very low risk of complications. Um, their infectious complication risk is lower than placebo. And so these are very, very safe medications. And so combining these two medications 
uh, certainly could be uh, done without an increased risk of complications. Um, the ideal combination therapy, it's not clear, you know, do you sort of combine, um, you know, biologic with an oral small molecule or just two biologics? Um, there's ongoing studies and hopefully we'll have the answer to that uh, relatively soon. Um, so just sort of overall conclusions from the talk. Um, so consider surgery in patients with isolated allele disease. So contrary to my, my video, um, you know, there is a subset of patients that have sort of ileal disease less than 40 centimeters um, that you could consider, certainly consider biologic therapy. Um, for sure, after your primary biologic failure, I should have a discussion with the patient in terms of whether you'd want to, um, you know, continue biologics or switch to a, a surgical option. Uh, and for sure, in patients that already have ileal stenosis or ileal uh, you know, fibrosis, where it's mainly scar tissue, then none of the biologics that we have is really going you know, to work, and surgery is probably um, the optimal treatment for those patients. Otherwise, um, early treatment of biologics is important, um, as we saw in the profile study. So we need to get these patients diagnosed quickly, started biologics quickly. And so one of those hurdles has been sort of solved in terms of getting access to biologic therapy, at least here in Quebec, where you can go directly to biologics after steroids. Um, and that early sort of um, diagnosis is something that we need to work on. And what we talked about, fecal top protectin, that's a great way to sort of um, identify those patients that probably have inflammatory bowel disease that need early biologic therapy. Um, and just, uh, again, to sort of stress the importance of fecal top protectin. I know the rheumatologists um, use fecal top protectin quite often and help us uh, kind of figure out which patients we need to see a little bit earlier, but uh, certainly using fecal top protectin uh, can help um, drive you know, early diagnosis, but also help us to optimize our treatment and improve outcomes. So I talked a lot about uh, biologic therapy and, and, and medical therapy and surgical therapy. So what can we do to prevent IBD? Um, and this was a really interesting study that was published in GUT about two years ago. And, and all of you listening on, you can kind of take a look at this, calculate your own HLI, your healthy living index. Um, and so this was actually uh, initially done on a prospective uh, uh, sort of cohort and then validated in another cohort in, in Europe. And you can see here the healthy living index, i.e. just eating and, and, and uh, exercising uh, puts you at a much lower risk of developing uh, IBD. And so uh, not drinking alcohol and having a normal BMI, um, being physically active, not smoking, having more fruits and vegetables and fibers and nuts, um, less red meat, more fish. And again, you can sort of calculate this on your own. And uh, if you have that HLI of seven to nine, um, then the chances of you developing IBD are, are about 50% less. So something to strive to, to avoid all of those surgical and medical treatments that we have to offer in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I'll stop here. And uh, I'll ask if anyone has any questions or, or comments. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Wakas, uh, Dr. Afif. A very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, I'm going to just uh, ask, just, uh, just uh, you, people can unmute, but I'm just going to ask a first question. Um, you know, coming from the cardiology world, it's a little bit surprising to see some of those results, quite low remission rate. Uh, you know, thirty six percent is is sort of the number that I remember now offhand, and um, as well like these measures at twenty six and thirty eight weeks. What's that about? Like, why not long? What happens to these people long term? These are very short remission rates. Uh, you know, remission rates at a short duration, uh, and, and and very low. Can you just comment on that? Sure. I mean, um, these are all sort of randomized studies. Uh, so their follow up is usually a year. There are long term extension studies that extend, you know, four or five, 10 years or so. Uh, depending on the medication, um, we sort of tend to lose response with certain medications. So certainly anti TNF medications, the loss of response is about, about 10 to 15% per year. Uh, with newer medications like the IL 23s or the IL 1223s, the loss of response is a little bit less um, over time. So, um, I think you're you're absolutely right. Our, our remission rates are, are terribly low, um, so sort of in that thirty to forty percent range uh, for most patients, and so that's why um, there's a sort of um, strive to either try something different, so early therapy, which could increase our rates, you know, up to sixty or seventy percent, or uh, using dual biologics to actually increase our rates um, above um, that low threshold of thirty percent that you mentioned. And just uh, just uh, in terms of cost of these biologics? Yeah, so the, the biologics are, are quite expensive. So um, usually for a year of therapy, they can range anywhere between forty and $60,000 per year. 
Um, there's biosimilars that are available for anti-CNFs and for ustekinumab that have decreased the prices by about 30 or 40 percent, and that's probably going to uh, decrease over time. Um, and so newer biologics that are coming in have to put in a price point that's in that same region as well. So they're going to be decreasing over time, but still very, very expensive compared to, um, for example, a thyropurine or a 5-ASA medication. Thank you, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Sure. So, so Vakasa, what is there? Are there a percentage of those patients that are actually cured, i.e., never uh, relapse thereafter with dual biologics? And are there predictors uh, of what that proportion uh, or, or of those patients might be? Yeah. So, the dual biologic therapy is, is something that's relatively new, and so we don't have a lot of data. We have the most follow up that we have is about one year or so with these patients, and so. We don't have an idea of how long you need to be on medications. Traditionally, if you take patients that were on just monotherapy with a biologic, for example, an anti-TNF, um, you know, there are studies that have shown that after five years of treatment, uh, patients that are in endoscopic remission and histologic remission and doing amazingly well, um, and if you stop their biologic, um, their rate of relapse is about 50% after about two years or so. So we definitely haven't cured the disease. The patients are in remission and doing well. Uh, with very little side effects, but as soon as you stop the medication, it's, it's a chronic disease, and, and when you stop these medications, for the most part, uh, patients will flare. We don't have a good way of predicting who's going to flare and who's not, um, and even if you look at sort of those patients that had early surgery, right, there was about 50% of patients that actually didn't need treatment, uh, whereas the other 50% did, right, so that, that's one of our issues that we don't have a, a good idea of who are the patients that are going to need long-term therapy versus who are the patients that um, we can stop early, and, and uh, unfortunately, that means that we end up over-treating uh, a lot of these patients with biologic medications, but just don't have a clear idea uh, of who these patients are that sort of require less therapy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wozik, you want to unmute yourself? Um, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Um, I was just wondering if there was any benefit or any data on the combination of DMARD therapy like Imuran or methotrexate with biologics before going to combination biologic? Yeah, so we've, we've done that for the last uh, 15 or 20 years um, in terms of using anti-TNF. So we, in the past, we've used a lot of anti-TNF with uh, a thyropurine so, or methotrexate. And certainly that's actually better, better than using monotherapy. And one of the main reasons is that um, with infliximab and adalimumab, the anti-TNFs, there's a very high rate of immunogenicity. So these patients develop antibodies to these medications, and we've done drug levels and antibodies. Um, and so that's why that 10 to 20% loss of response per year is probably because of the immunogenicity. With their newer medications, um, like the IL-23s or the 1223s, the rate of immunogenicity is much, much lower. It's about a 5% range. And so with these newer medications, there hasn't been any benefit by adding uh, methotrexate or uh, immunomodulators like thyropurine. So we're using them a lot less, uh, particularly because we're using a lot more of these newer biologics. Um, and so um, and that's why we sort of kind, of kind of pivoted a little bit to use start think about using dual biologics because just using the thyropurine uh, along with the biologic doesn't seem to be enough to break that threshold of 30 to 40 percent. Thank you. Thank you. Sasha, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So that was awesome. That was such a clear and good presentation, very relevant. And so what, uh, what Sophie just said is also true that, that those drugs are not used except for maybe in such cases on their own, like maybe you use az azathioprine in pregnant patients if they're modeled, or you just don't use azathioprine anymore. I mean, we still use a little bit of azathioprine. I think if you're going to go on infliximab um, for whatever reason, because okay. you had acute severe UC and you needed infliximab in hospital, um, or you have an extra intestinal manifestation, you have, you know, angst bond, uh, and you need to go on infliximab, then those patients would get infliximab. We've been doing a little bit of proactive monitoring uh, of the drug levels with these patients to sort of avoid the antibody issue, but a lot of these patients end up uh, needing an immunosuppressive agent. So uh, we are using them in, in certain clinical um, areas uh, and, and situations. I think more and more um, we're sort of kind of avoiding the anti-TNFs a little bit more just because um, the efficacy seems to be about equal, you know, in the absence of an extra intestinal manifestation, the efficacy seems to be about equal uh, between an anti-TNF and um, one of the newer biologics uh, or the JAK inhibitors, but the safety profile is, is a lot safer with the IL-23s, the 1223s and alpha-4 beta-7. So less risks of infectious complications uh, mainly. And so um, this is why we're using a lot more of the newer biologics compared to medications like infliximab. 
Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, Mark, you want to mute again? Yeah, Rakesh, just curious. Uh, you know, you know, the bone marrow transplant community is always looking for indications, just like your surgeons at the beginning uh, of, uh, of your presentation. And, uh, you know, I've shown really promising stuff and relapsing remitting uh, MS and other rheumatologic conditions. Is anybody doing any work in IBD with auto transplants or is Sasha uh, also suggested CAR T cells? So the, uh, they have done studies with BMT, so mainly in very, very refractory patients, so the patients that haven't responded to therapy or had multiple surgeries. There has been a couple of studies using uh, bone, bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, the, the risk of, um, of complications is, is quite high or has been quite high with these medicate, with these uh, treatments. And so it hasn't really caught on. There are a couple of groups that sort of continue to try uh, bone marrow transplant. And it, it, it does have sort of variable success in that 30 to 40% range. And that can sort of be a little bit more long lasting. Uh, but unfortunately, just because of the, you know, uh, the side effect profile, the, you know, a lot of these patients are quite young. Um, and so, uh, because of the risk of complications and mortality associated with the BMT when it was done, uh, it hasn't really sort of caught on in terms of, uh, routine clinical treatment. But again, in, in patients with very, very severe refractory disease where nothing is working, um, there are a couple of centers where you can actually refer, um, uh, these patients for bone marrow, bone marrow transplant. Thank you. Go ahead, yeah. Alex. Well, Kass, uh, there's a couple of comments. So first, uh, it seems to me like uh, the Mediterranean diet is the way to go with your HLI that you presented, right? So uh, I think that's good. One question about dual therapy. Uh, do you, th you know, from that study you showed us, uh, golimumab, gosiclimab, do you think uh, that a delta of, you know, 15% for remission is going to be enough to convince payers, you know, to pay for two two biologic therapies, you know, especially when you don't have long-term long, long -term data? And so that's only... I mean, how, how do you how do you see that? Like, what will it take, do you think, to have payers actually pay for dual biologic therapy? Because it, it will end up being, you know, quite costly, especially if you have these patients long term. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was a proof of concept study. Um, there are more recent studies that we're participating in now that um, are combining those two agents. And instead of just using it during induction, you use it throughout the whole year, which I think will all, probably also increase uh, the rate of uh, endoscopic remission for these patients. And the newer sort of agents, it's actually not two different injections. It's actually they're combining them into one medication, right? So it'll be just one medication with two different biologics. So, um, you know, what's going to be the cost of that? I, I don't know. Uh, hopefully it'll be sort of priced to run the same range as what we're using right now, especially in the area of, of biosimilars. Um, and so there's been sort of significant um, requests from the government to sort of decrease the cost of these medications, especially if we're using them long term. And so... Mm -hmm. I think time will tell, but I, I think going sort of that route of dual biologics is probably the only, one of the only things that we can do for right now, because, you know, as you know, all the other biologics and small molecules we've used um, give us around the same sort of rates of endoscopic remission um, and clinical remission. So we have to try something different. And so using two biologics at the same time um, seems to be a possible way of increasing the risk, the rate of endoscopic remission. And you would use that in, in selected patients who are medically refractory. Is that is that or so? This is actually in bio naive patients, right? So, um, so just yeah, because I'm thinking bio naive. How would that differ if you use you know the good old traditional combo therapy and fliximab plus uh, you know thiopurine, you know, which is also quite effective. Like, it'd be interesting to see if in bio naive patients there's actually a difference between dual biologic therapy and and combination thiopurines and uh, biologics. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we haven't been able to sort of identify which patients are the ones that are going to require sort of more therapy. I know that we all have a clinical sense when you scope someone and they have big, deep ulcerations um, that, you know, these are the ones that you worry about a little bit more um, or that are already sort of beginning to have stenosis that you worry about about more. And those are the probably the patients that are probably going to be most, the, the patients that will probably both most benefit from using dual biologic therapy. But again, it's, it's something in progress. I, I think when it comes out, we're probably going to use it in more refractory patients. But in the end, I think in order to improve our sort of rates of remission, uh, we might need to be a bit more aggressive right. um, in terms of um, using the dual biologics, you know, if they're not cost prohibitive. Thanks. And just one last comment. Wakas, could you refer us to that surgeon who has all that OR time? <laughs> this was 10 years ago, so that surgeon <laughs> no longer exists because they don't have enough OR time because it's very, very difficult. Uh, to, to get patients operated. Maybe you can send them to the same areas where they have to <laughs> rectal surgeons and, and thankfully they've been able to, to scare patients a little bit quicker as well. Uh, thank you very much, Sasha. Well, actually, Sophie had a great, great response and, and I was asking 
um, if Vakas wanted to comment on how he uses drug levels, he probably he uses them similar to um, how Sophie does. But I, it seemed to me like GI uses drug levels a lot more than maybe, I don't know, Derm or, or Room does. And maybe in part it's because some of our, the, the biologics we use in rheumatology, I guess you can't get levels, but how, how do you use them? And are there going to be other levels of other, other biologics that are newer? Are you going to eventually use drug levels for them too? It's it's a very good question. So I think one of the reasons why we're using levels is because we had very limited options in the beginning, uh, unlike in rheumatology. Um, and so we were kind of stuck with two agents and we kind of wanted to optimize them as much as possible. Um, the rates of immunogenicity with infliximab and alimab are the highest, highest with infliximab. And so I think if you're going to use infliximab, and I know the rheumatologists don't use as much infliximab as, as we did, um, that it's probably worthwhile to either start a thyroperine at the same time to avoid immunogenicity or to use them uh, a little bit more regularly. So typically that would mean sort of using it during an induction period, so post-induction um, and then during maintenance to see if we need to dose escalate patients. Um, with adalimumab, the immunogenicity is a little bit less, uh, but we still use it quite routinely in patients that are losing response. Um, so with the newer agents, um, the rate of immunogenicity is quite, quite low, uh, so less than sort of 5 to 10%. So the utility of using uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is a lot less. Um, and the other issue with some of the newer agents is that there isn't actually any data for dose optimization. So for example, the IL-23s, um, they've done studies where patients have lost response and they've tried to give them more drug um, and it doesn't seem to help, right? And so in the absence of any positive data to suggest that dose optimization will be helpful with the newer biologics, we're probably not going to use therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, but where, when we're using adalimumab and fliximab, where there is benefit from dose optimization and higher immunogenicity rates, then I think it, it's important to sort of consider using um, drug levels in those patients. Yes, I see Sasha's question there. Sasha, do you want to verbalize it? Because that was the kind of question that I had you're, you know, you're giving biologics, uh, maybe dual uh, biologics to potentially very young patients. Are you concerned for the future of these patients in terms of potential complications, uh, as in Sasha's question there, where she's uh, talking about long-term cardiac and cancer outcomes with JAK inhibitors? Um, so at least for the other biologics, there doesn't seem to be any sort of increased risk of, um, you know, cardiac or malignant complications, uh, particularly with the newer agents. Uh, there is some sort of controversial data with ACT-TNFs um, in terms of malignancy, but in terms of um, infectious complications or cardiac complications, there doesn't seem to be any increased risk associated with, with ACT-TNF in our population. Um, and JAK inhibitors... Um, as Sasha knows that there is, um, you know, a couple of studies that have shown an increased risk of complications, either cardiac or thrombosis risk in older patients with other cardiovascular uh, uh, risk factors. But in the IBD population, uh, the JAK inhibitors um, haven't really shown uh, any risk of any complications. So we have about 10 years of data with tofacitinib in ulcerative colitis patients, and we haven't really seen any increased risk of uh, malignancy um, or any cardiac or thrombosis risk associated with it. So it's sort of a little bit of a different population. And so in our in inflammatory bowel disease, we haven't really seen that increased risk. Um, certainly in sort of higher risk populations or older patients um, that have other cardiovascular disease uh, risk factors, then yeah, then there is a question about uh, talking to our, our patients about whether we would use it. Um, and so we tend to sort of stay away from the JAK inhibitors if uh, they're high risk patients. Uh, so patients that have already had a thrombosis or, you know, already have um, other cardiac issues, then we tend to stay away because we have a lot safer options. Um, so it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. And so because a lot of our patients are, are, are younger, um, we feel a little bit more confident in using those JAK inhibitors in the right circumstances. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oops, does low FODMAP diet work in IBD? And if so, why? So, I mean, there's a bit of an overlap between IBS and IBD, right? So about uh, maybe 30 or 40 percent of patients with IBD have some degree of IBS. And so when patients come in with clinical symptoms, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out, is this IBS or IBD? And that's why that fecal calprotectin is so helpful. It's an objective marker of disease activity. And so in patients that have IBD, but also have IBS, um, putting them on a low FODMAP diet, just like we would for any other IBS patients, can help with clinical symptoms and make patients feel uh, a bit better. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You had lots of questions there. Uh, what's the, okay, one last one. What's the deal with uh, 
tefacitinib and bowel perforation is an important consideration in IBD? Um, so in the clinical studies uh, with any of the JAK inhibitors, there has been some reports of uh, bowel perforation. If you sort of look into the data, it's patients that already had very, you know, stenotic disease or other compl uh, complications prior to starting the JAK inhibitor. So we're not 100% clear. It's not something that we um, sort of talk about too much. I mean, it, it's there, it's been reported, but I, I think most of those reports have been in patients that have risk factors uh, that already have a stenosis and that puts them at a higher risk of having uh, bowel perforation. So, um, it, you know, in, in more recent studies with uh, newer JAK inhibitors, we haven't seen that uh, that risk as much. Thank you so much. Any, uh, Ale, any final words? Uh, you guys have a, you know, very well reputed uh, IBD program. You follow a lot of patients. Uh, any, any final words, Ale, uh, from no, your team? No, I think I want to thank, uh, you know, Wakas for, for a great talk and really looking at, you know, important pertinent questions in, in the clinical arena. Yes, and we do have the MUHC IBD Center, which is, as uh, Wakas told you, is extremely active. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of that. And certainly you're all welcome to refer patients to Wakas. And uh, <laughs> we're going to go, but, but thank you very much, Wakas, for a great, for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Akas. Really excellent presentation. Congratulations on all the work you're doing in this area. Uh, thank you, Alain, as well. Uh, good luck, and we look forward to hearing back from you in a couple of years to see the evolution. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Alain. Thanks, Nadia.